have to get it done. I don't have a choice. And I'm really rather than Victor by all means to reach out. So I want to do a continuation of the problem that I that I did last time. This is a more uh, drop problem.
wasn't running. Ah, okay. Okay. okay, so the next question is uh, what is the velocity at C? So these are the questions. Okay, so we'll, we'll solve this problem. Very typical problem, you'll get problems like this uh, quite often. I'll put this, put this board up just so that you can see the problem. Now, I, I will not give you this uh, normally, but whenever you do a problem like this, as I said already once, you first list down the formulas you know. So put that in one corner of your, of your paper. So we know, for example, that distance d is average velocity times t. That's the simplest one that we had learned. We had learned several. We also know that distance traveled y is initial velocity times time plus one half acceleration times time square. That's the formula we know. We know that final velocity is initial velocity plus acceleration times time. And final velocity square is v0 square plus twice acceleration times distance traveled or displacement, why? You need to memorize these, so don't screw it up. Okay. Screwing this up is, you are done <laughs> before you even start. So you've got to know these things. All right, so in this case, actually doing B is easier. The velocity at C is much easier to do. So let's first do B. It really doesn't matter, but let's do B first. So as far as b is concerned, uh, we, we are interested in the velocity uh, at point c, right, at the final point, at the lowest point. Uh, we know the height, we know g, and we also know the initial velocity v0 of the ball, which means that it will be quite convenient to use this formula because we don't know time. So therefore, the natural choice would be the last one of the list. So v final squared, that's the velocity at c is what I'm after. v0 square is going to be 4.00 meters per second square, because that is the initial velocity with which it's being thrown up. And then you have g acting downward, so minus 2, 9.80 meters per second square. And y is 100, that's also minus. So these are the quantities that I have. It's very easy to work it out. Uh, so 4 squared is 16. We know that. So 16.0 meters squared over second square. That's not a problem. Twice 9.8 is 19.6. So 19.6 multiplied by 100 is going to be 1960. And two minuses make it a plus. So I make it plus 1960 also comes up with the same units, meter square plus second square. So we are in, we are in good shape, easy to do. So 1960 plus 16 is going to be 1976. Uh, I'm not paying great deal of attention to significant figures, as you can tell. But when I'm doing rough calculations on the board, I will not be paying a great deal of attention to significant figures until I get to the end. When I do homeworks, we'll be very careful, but not here because without a calculator, otherwise we run into trouble. So to get the final velocity, v final, you see, I have to take a square root of 1976 
and square root of 1976 is not quite that easy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, fine. This is this is a bit complicated. I don't want to I don't want to fool around with this right now. So I'm just going to approximate 1976 for now with something I can do easily. I'll make it 2,000. It's a nice round number. Should be should be easy enough to work with. And 2,000, of course, can be factorized into 100, which is of which I can take a square root very easily, and times 20, of which I can't take a square root very easily. And 20 can be factorized to 4 times 5. I can root 4, that's of course 2. I can't root 5, not, not easily. So what I want you guys to do is that you guys will have to know certain prime numbers per root. So I'm going to put it up, and you better not forget it. Square root of 2 is 1.414. You are expected to know this. Square root of 3 is 1.732. Square root of 5 is 2.236. These three you're expected to know. Square root of seven, I'll give you. But these are elementary enough that this should be among the stuff that you should know whole. So in this case, as you can see, this is going to, be, if, if I root this, uh, so, uh, so root of 200, uh, 2000, I'll put an approximate sign here. That's an approximate sign, meter per second. So this is going to be uh, 10 times 2 times 2.236. So as you can see, 10 times 2 is 20. 20 times 2 is 40. 20 times 2.2 .2 is 44. So in other words, what this rough approximation is telling us is that the velocity of this ball, by the time it reaches the ground, is approximately 44 meters per second. Is that, is that the exact answer? Obviously not, because we, we didn't do 1976, which was, which was what we had. We simplified it, but it's a good enough answer for us. So these kind of approximations I'll teach you how to do, and you'll be doing them all the time for classwork. There's something I've done which is not perfect here. What have I done? What have I missed? Square root. No, that I already acknowledged I missed. Some, huh? Something I didn't acknowledge. <coughs> Plus minus, very good. So whenever you are doing a square root, you have two choices, right? So in other words, this should be plus minus. Both are possible. Because the minus 44 square will also get, give me 2,000 in this case, and plus 44 square will also give me 2,000, roughly. So plus minus is something that you should never miss. I missed it because I wanted to show you that I missed it so you remember it. So in this case, of course, plus sign means upward velocity. That's a possibility, but right now that's not possible. It's a possibility if the ball hits the ground and bounces up. Then it's a possibility. But right now, as it goes down, it's just negative. So the only velocity that matters should be the minus sign. And you are supposed to choose that. You are supposed to be able to select the minus sign because that is the correct sign in this case. So we have slightly overestimated the actual number, but that's OK. Our purpose is not to do everything perfectly, exactly, when we are making estimations. Now let's move on to part A. So part A uh, of the problem is, what is the time of fall? So this is an interesting problem, because you see, time of fall here incorporates both the upward motion, stop, and the downward motion. So time of fall is the full flight time. So let us see if what we know is good enough to give that answer one shot. Actually, this is where the sign convention comes in really handy. Because the sign convention 
makes it possible to do calculations one shot without breaking it up. So we don't have to, we don't have to break up the motion to going up and stopping, and then from stopping to falling. We don't have to do that. That saves a lot of work. We can just do the sign convention right, and we can go from releasing the ball to going up, stopping, and coming down all in one go. So that's what I'm going to do now. So to find the time, uh, using our three weapons, or four weapons, these are our weapons, right? Now I need to find time, so I can no longer use this formula, because this formula doesn't have time. I can use, this is not very useful right now, I can use either of these, but you see I know the final velocity, I know the initial velocity, and I know the acceleration, so this is the easiest one to use. And you always want to use the easiest one to use, because that means you are protecting yourself from making an error. So always take the easiest problem, easiest uh, path that you can take. So final velocity, I already know, that's, uh, let's say, approximately minus 44 meters per second. Initial velocity, now you see that that's where the sign business comes in. Plus 4.00 meters per second minus 9.80 meters per second squared times time. So now I can easily do this calculation and now you see something interesting happening. Because this velocity, the final velocity which had a downward vector and the initial velocity that had an upward vector, as you try to calculate time, these two actually add up because this one I'm going to take to the left side so I can say minus 9.80 meters per second squared times time is equal to, if I take this to the other side, 44 plus 4 is going to be 48, so it will be minus 48.00 meters per second, or whatever, 48.0. So now you see, I have minuses on both sides, so I can multiply with minus 1, that goes away, and if I now divide, to get the time, I have 48.0 meters per second divided by 9.80 meters per second squared. So that would mean meters per second, meters per second. This second will come upstairs because it's a double down. Okay. So now I'll get, I'll simplify things a little bit. I'll make it 48 over 10, roughly, uh, seconds. So that's approximately 4.8 seconds. So it will take about 4.8 seconds, approximately, not exact, because we have rounded off, for the ball to go up, stop, and come down. Okay? So this problem can also be done uh, directly. So I can also directly do this part A. So let's repeat this problem very quickly, directly. So part A. I'm not going to do part B first, like I did right now. I'm just going to do part A in one shot. So if I want to do part A in one shot, I know that my y is minus 100. So that I know. I know my g is minus 9.80 meters per second squared. I know my launch velocity v0 is plus 4.00 uh, meters per second. My question is, how long does it take to go down? So I'm going to part A directly, instead of breaking it down like I showed you. So in this case, as you list what you know, the answer is obvious, because you need to find T, and you are using Y. So this is the only one that you can use. You have no other choice, right? You can't use this, there is no T. You can't use this, because there is no Y. So that's the only one you can use. As you practice, 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 which is what I want you to do, you'll get better and better at this. So naturally then, I need to set this problem up. So I'll write y, which is minus 100 meters, equals v0t, which is going to be 4.00 uh, meters per second times time, uh, minus a half gt square. So minus uh, half of 9.8 is 4.90 meters per second square times t squared, so I don't know time. And as I've already taught you when you did the homeworks, I've already taught you that if you have 
and a quadratic equation ax squared plus bx plus c equal to 0, this quadratic equation is solvable. And the solution to the quadratic equation of this form is x equals minus b plus minus because there are two roots. It's a quadratic equation. x to the power 2 means there are two roots. x to the power 3 means there are three roots and so on. b squared minus 4ac square root over 2a. So this is a very ancient formula credited to an Indian mathematician, Aryabhatta. Don't ask me how old it is because I, don't, I honestly don't know, but it's, it's in the BC range, not in the AD range. So as far as I know, but I may be wrong. But anyway, so this is the solution to the quadratic equation that you should know. You, you need to memorize that. So I will have to solve this problem using that. So in other words, let me just organize my terms. So I'm going to write it in that form. So I'm going to bring the last term on the right side. So that will be 4.90. Let me drop units now for convenience. Uh, 4.90 t squared. This will be a minus sign as I pull to the right. So that will be 4.00 t. And then I'll have a minus of 100 time equal to 0. That's my, that's my quadratic equation form. Let's make sure I didn't mess anything up. No, so far so good. So according to Aryabhatta's formula, I'm looking for time minus b. This is a plus b there in the formula statements. I, I already have, uh, so I need, to, I need to minus the minus b. So in other words, this becomes plus 4. Plus minus b squared, so that will be 4.00 squared, minus 4, a is going to be 4.90, and c is going to be minus 100, divided by 2a, 2a is twice 4.9, so that will be 9.80. So two minuses make it a positive. 4.9 times 2 is 9.8. It's like 5 times 2 is 10. 4.9 times 2 is 9.8. 4.9 times 4 is therefore 19.6. 9.8 times 2 is 19.6. So this number is 19.6. 19.6 times 100. That means this number is 19.6. Okay, so 1960 plus 16 is 1976. By the way, remember we saw 1976 before. So therefore, what we have, let's pull this up. Therefore, what we have is we have t uh, equal to four plus minus 1976 square root divided by 9.80. 1976 square root I've already calculated, so I'm not going to repeat my labor. So this is 4.00 plus minus roughly 44, right? That's what we got. 9.80. So since negative time doesn't have any meaning, it's going to be physically not very useful, so we throw it away. We only use the positive time, that means 44 plus 4 is 48. 48 divided by roughly 10, again gives me the same answer. It's about 4.80 seconds, which is, by the way, the answer I got before. So there are two ways of doing this, this problem, this part A of the problem. Both are quite straightforward, but it's a learning curve for you, I understand that. And that's something that, that's why I just did it in great detail. Before I move on, let me quickly ask you if there are any questions. Yes? When you first put the formula into the quadratic equation, you put in negative 100. Didn't the negative 100 start on the other side of the equal sign, and therefore you brought it over to positive? No, negative 100 remained on the other side, right? What was that? Negative 100 was on the left side. I took everything to the left side, so my right side became 0. So all the lefties became a change sign. So plus 4 became uh, minus 4.9 became a plus 
plus 4.00 become a minus 4.00. Okay. Right. Any other question? Yes. You have to shout much, much more. I can't even see you. Okay. So significant figures I'm ignoring now, as I said. Because I'm doing everything by hand, and we are not allowed the use of calculators in class. So I'm going to simplify numbers and play with numbers so I can get the calculations done. So right now, when I'm doing my rough calculations, I won't be a stickler for significant figures like the way I am when I do the homeworks, OK? So, so yes, I mean, in this case, the problem is basically given in three significant figures. So as long as I record my answer in two significant figures, I'm pretty safe. All right, That's how I do it. Because otherwise, when I give you real problems in the quizzes or in exams and so on, if you are getting too caught up on significant figures, you'll never be able to do it. It'll just take you a long time. And at that point, there is marginal gain. I just want you to know and use significant figures accurately, in the, and that's done in the homeworks. But in the class, I'm teaching you how to, how to make estimates, how to play with numbers, how to see through the problem. OK, good question. Any other question? Yes? Do you want us to show units like what we're doing? Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. I do, because I'll tell you why. Most students who are here who are new, they will lose so many points because they'll mess up units after the third or fourth step. That, and it's a very avoidable mistake. And I myself actually carry units when I do calculations. So not carrying units. It's unnecessarily sloppy. Any other question? All right. Good? We are set? OK. I don't want to lose my glasses. And I want people to see you guys. All right. Now we'll do an interesting problem. Uh, suppose this is a window. I'm looking at the window from the side. So this is, a, this is a window. Of course, the window is not hanging in, in vacuum. There are walls here which I'm not drawing, all right? And you have nothing to do today. So here you are, well, you're too small compared to the window, but let's, let's forget about that. Here you are near the window. And it's, it's not a big window, it's about a meter. Let's say the window is one meter. So it is not to scale, I'm sorry. So y is equal to 1.00 uh, meter, all right? So now suppose, since you have nothing to do, you're, you're watching out the window, you see something fall. So let's now label things up a little bit. Let's call this A, let's call this B. And since I'm measuring y, most likely I'll have to play with displacement, I will make this to be my y equal to 0 point, which means that this will be my y equal to minus 1.00 point meters. So now you see something fall. So whatever is falling, it falls like this. You catch, you catch a glimpse of it as it enters your, your uh, field of vision, continues on and then obviously disappears from your field of vision. We have all seen things fall. The simple thing here is it's falling vertical. Just vertical. Keep life simple. And you have a watch. You don't need a watch. You have a cell phone. Uh, and you're, with your cell phone, let's say you can record the time. And cell phones come with stopwatches. So you can record time quite precisely. And let's say the time of fall, that the time it takes to travel from A to B is, I'm really going to throw away significant figures right now, okay? Uh, 1 upon 20th of a second, 0 0.05 seconds. That's, by the way, not a very short time in terms of things falling. That is a relatively long time. Just to give you a sense of times associated with falls, that's actually a relatively long time. Now, the, the trick in this problem is that this was not at rest here. This was already falling, and it continued to fall. 
So in other words, it had a velocity here and it had a velocity there. And our job, our job is to find the velocity at A. So I'll put a question mark. I want you to do the same. Whatever it is that you want to find, record it, put a question mark next to it. I also want to find what is B. That's my objective right now. Are you using the phone, my dear? You don't get a quiz today. Don't use a phone. Can you keep your phone away, please? Yes. I just gave the magnitude here, okay, and here I'm putting in the sign. I've just decided I'll choose my y equal to zero here. So you can just erase this right now. This was when I was introducing the problem and talking about it. Just to save confusion. Thank you for pointing out. Any other questions? Okay. So, so let's see what we know in this world. Again, we, we know our formulas. I've already recorded them here. Uh, I know why. So I, I'm restricted to choosing between this and that. But I know time, which means I can't use this, which means I'm back to this one. So I know y, I know time, I know a. So I can find v0. I have all the ingredients needed to find v0. So let us do the following. I will write y as 1.00 meters. I would write v0, 1 over 20 seconds, because there is a v0 t. Then I would write minus a half, 9.80 meters per second squared, times t squared. Again, it's a quadratic equation. Oh, this is not a quadratic equation. I already know t. I'm sorry. I'm confusing. This, a lot. this is 1 over 20 squared. So I'm after V0. So this calculation is a little bit messy, actually. Not my favorite calculation. But since I gave you this problem, I'll take the pain to show you what I'm doing. So let us say, since I'm after V0, I take V0 to the left side of the equation. So I make it V0 times 1 upon 20. For now, I'm not going to write the units. I've already written up the units. I know what it is. I will pull this minus 1, no, oh, yeah, I can do that. I can pull this, uh, let's see. So I've kept this plus means I have to flip sign. Uh, maybe you guys will lose me. OK, let me do it this way. I'll, I, I'll not uh, hop, skip, and jump too much. So 1.00 minus 4.90 divided by 20 square is 400. But since there is a minus here, I'll make this a plus. I'll make this minus a plus, And I'll make this plus a minus by multiplying consistently with a minus sign to the right and left, which doesn't change my equation at all. You guys are with me? Anybody lost me? You lost me? Why? Where? Yeah, I've just. Anybody else? Yes. So I, if I, t okay, imagine I kept V0 on the right side, then the sign won't change. If I take this to the other side, this will become plus. I've written the exact same thing, but with V0 written on the other side. It doesn't matter. If A is equal to B, B is also equal to A, right? I made it negative, and I made this positive, right, initially. Then I multiplied throughout by a minus sign. I multiplied left side by a minus sign, right side by a minus sign. Then I OK. So now what do we have? So now what we have is 
a situation where I can write, uh, let me get rid of this 20. This 20 is a little annoying. So I'll put this 20 on the other side. This is 4.9 over 400. Let me make my life easier by approximating it as 5 over 400 minus 1. Okay? So, Yes. So now what I have is V0 is approximately equal to 20 uh, times 1 over 80, right, minus 1. So therefore, this will be 20 uh, times uh, 1 minus 80, sorry. So this would be minus 20 times uh, 79 by 80 meters per second. 5 over 400, 5 times 8 is 40. So I just, multi I just made 5 over 400 into 1 over 80. So 1 over 80 minus 1 is minus 79 by 80. I pull the minus out. So here I can do some cancellation, that will be 4, so therefore V0 I'll get is going to be minus 79 by 4 meters per second. So I can convert that, it will be slightly shy of 20 meters per second. So let's divide it, 79 divided by 4, 4 1 to 4, 39, 4 times 9 is 36, that leaves me with 3, so 19 three quarters. So therefore, the velocity here is going to be uh, minus 19.7, if you will, or 75 or 8, whatever, meters per second. Roughly. We have made one round of 4.9, I've converted to 5. So we can calculate this V0, which is really my VA. So this V0, what I call V0, is really VA. That is the velocity at the top, just around here, when I first saw it, okay? So, now if you do the remaining calculation, I have to calculate the velocity at B, and to calculate the velocity at B, I have to get, basically, I know the time, I know the time, I know G, I know V0, which means I can use so I know this, I know the time, I know that, so I can find V final. So VB then is equal to minus 19.7 meters per second, minus 9.8 meters per second squared, that's G, and the time is 1 over 20 seconds. So I have 10 divided by 20, roughly. This is 10 divided by 20, that's roughly about a half. So that means this number is half a second more, which means minus 20.2 meters per second, roughly. Again, I've cheated everywhere with significant figures, but uh, it's okay. Yes? Because this is half, right? This number is roughly 0 0.5, 0 0.7, roughly. 10 by 20 is roughly half. So I'm just adding the two. They both have the same sign. You guys are okay with it? All right. Uh, 
There is another problem that I ideally like to do, but I'd rather put it in my notes, and I'll have you look it up, and I'll assign a homework problem like that. Let me spend the last uh, 15, 20, well, I have a, since we have a quiz, we'll start in about 15 minutes. So um, let me go here and do something else. So I've already told you about scalars and vectors. Just a few, un another unpleasant thing, I don't like to go over these things again and again, but the quiz is actually like an exam. You just take it all the time, okay? So, generally kids are very good, but over years I have had kids cheat. You see, we don't really insist that you sit far away and so on. I don't like you to make, un like to make you guys uncomfortable. But when people cheat, it's almost impossible for us to figure out who is the creator of the material. So we catch n number of people cheating because things look the same, mistakes are the same, and we give zeros to all of them for the whole quiz. And this happens more than once. I gave an F for the course, because the university policy is quite strict with regard to cheating. Intellectual uh, honesty is held at very high esteem in all AAU Research One universities, which is what UB is. It's one of the elite league of universities, six universities in the US, that belong to a certain elite group. So we try to maintain things very carefully. So I, I really urge you not to even try uh, to go there because I don't think of you guys as my, you know, as as other people. I think of you guys as my own uh, as my own kids. Uh, and uh, when when you violate trust, uh, yes, it is painful. But the action I have to take is even more painful because. It's a very serious action, and it has significant consequences on your career for the rest of your life, because you get marked up in your transcript as somebody who cheated. I had to do this twice in my career so far, and I can assure you they were the hardest things I've done as a professor, and I've been a professor here for 25 years. So please don't uh, you know, violate the trust I, I put on you guys. I want to talk about vectors because vectors is something that came in early, but I chose not to do it in great detail. But now it's going to become very important. And in particular, we'll talk about vector algebra. So, So by algebra, we are primarily interested in adding and subtracting vectors. So there are two predominant ways in which we deal with vectors. Vectors are, of course, quantities that have both magnitude and direction. I gave you an example of velocity. Velocity has magnitude and direction. Uh, for example, I may be moving at 10 miles per hour eastward. That's a vector. So 10 miles per hour, and this is due east. But then I, I might be moving at 10 miles per hour due south. The point is this vector is not the same as that vector. Their magnitudes are the same, but the direction has changed. And likewise, as I go around in a circle, my direction is continuously changing. Because if I go around in a circle, out here, my velocity would be a tangent to this curve. So it will be like that. Whereas over here, let's say, my velocity would be the tangent to the local curve here. 
which means my velocity would be that way. So you see, as I'm going around in a circle, my velocity vector is continuously changing. So vectors, therefore, are special, and you have to deal with vector algebras to how you add and subtract vectors. So one simple way of doing this is graphically. This is good for visualization, but it's not necessarily good for actual practical implementation, because most times we deal with vectors, they are sufficiently complex that doing it graphically may not be most convenient. So suppose I have a vector A. This is a vector with the arrow. And suppose I have a vector B. And this is a vector with the arrow. When you do graphical calculations with vectors, what you do is very simple. You take vector A as if it's an object. And you put it in one point, this point here. You put the tail of this vector here. You keep the orientation exactly the same, just like you are taking it in total and putting it without changing the angle. Because if you change the angle, you change the vector, right? It has a directionality. This is called parallel translating a vector. So I have parallel translated this vector here. Then I take this vector b, and I parallel translate this vector. And I can do two things. The first thing I'll do is I'll put their tails together. So in other words, I'll take b. This is going to be the exact same length, exact same magnitude, but the tails are together. So in graphical manipulation of vectors, what you do is you now complete, in this case, because they are perpendicular, you'll end up completing what will be a rectangle in this case. And the resultant vector of A and B is going to be the diagonal. So that's going to be your answer. And let's call this vector C. And you will say that vector A plus vector B is vector C. So this is the graphical way of manipulating vectors. So suppose these vectors were at an angle. Suppose I had A like this. But suppose B now was like that. So what I can do is I can take this vector B and put it again tail to tail. And now I complete the parallelogram. And again, this would be my resultant vector C. Okay, so this is B, you say, and, and this then would be my C. So one simple thing that you can already notice is because of this parallelogram-based approach, whether I put this vector B and vector A in such a way that their tails are together, or whether I put the vector A such that tail of vector A is in the tip of ta sorry, tail of vector B is in the tip of vector A, it doesn't matter. Because this is same as that, as you can see. It's a parallelogram. So either you do tail to tail, or you do tail to tip. So if I have a whole bunch of vectors to add, then it is very, very easy if I do it on a graph paper or on some screen that has graph paper built into it, by simply dragging the vectors and adding them up and, and picking the resultant vector from there. So as I can have a very complicated set of vectors, A, let's say, B like that, C like this, then D like that, E like this, and F like that, the resultant would be I go from this tail to this tip. That's going to be my resultant vector. So it is extremely convenient to also deal with this graphically when you have a large number of vectors to add. And there are algorithms that you can use to do that very well. Now, unfortunately or fortunately, that's not the tool that we often use because it's inconvenient. When you are trying to do a quick calculation, you often want to get, get the answer. And getting the answer if it requires you to go through that much drawing, 
that may not always be the best tool. Sometimes it could be, but other times it may not be. So the other way of doing vectors is algebraically. Whether adding or subtracting, subtraction is same as addition with a minus sign. All right. Don't talk. So Suppose, let me just take one vector. I'll show you how to resolve vectors. Let's let this be a vector. Let me call this vector P. Okay. So I want to resolve this vector. The word is resolve. It's a technical word, and resolve has a meaning. The meaning is that I place the tail of P along a coordinate system but this is my x-axis and that's my y-axis. Now what I do is I go to the tip of P, to the edge of P, and I drop a perpendicular here. So this is a 90 degree. And then I do the very same thing if I want, and I drop a perpendicular on the y-axis. So that is a 90 degree. So it turns out, that in doing this thing, by dropping these two perpendiculars, I've actually resolved P. How? This piece that ends up on the x-axis has a name. It is called the x component of P. It also has a, has a direction. And Px is what we normally call it. If it were another vector c, we would call it cx, and so on. Likewise, the y component, which is the same here and here, would be py. And again, that will also be a vector like that. So physicists and mathematicians, they can have a living because of the right, right angle triangle. Right angle triangle is, is very, very good for us because we know something called Pythagoras theorem. And the idea of the Pythagoras theorem is, if you have a vector A, or let's call it a side A for now. Forget about vector. Side B, and you call it side C, Pythagoras taught us that as long as this is on a plain sheet of paper, on a flat sheet of paper, A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. That's what Pythagoras taught us. So here what we do, is we realize that when we place this vector uh, on this coordinate frame, we not only have the vector to deal with, but we also have to think about an angle that this vector makes with respect to some axis. By default, by default, this angle turns out to be along the positive x-axis. So it turns out then that some ratios matter. So if I say cosine of theta, usually written as cos of theta, cosine of theta, cosine of theta is nothing but a pure number. It's a ratio. It's a ratio of what? It's a ratio, in this case of px, divided by the length of p. That's cosine of theta. And there's another quantity one can define, which is sine of theta. And sine of theta is going to be the vertical piece, Py over P. In this case, you see, if this is theta, the side opposite to theta is the vertical side. And the side adjacent to theta is the x side. So these are all conventions. But Pythagoras theorem now tells us, because Px squared plus Py squared is going to be P squared, Pythagoras theorem tells us the following identity, 
sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is equal to 1. Because if I square this, I have px squared over p squared. If I square that, it's py squared over p squared. If I add the two, it's px squared plus py squared over p squared equal to 1, which is what you have. So the reason why I'm doing this is because my next step will actually be doing a great deal of high-speed algebra in front of you using this tool that I have developed for you uh, as I get into what is chapter 3. So at this point, we are actually done with chapters 1 and 2 of your textbook, and we are headed to chapter 3. So please move your stuff away. We'll go to the quiz now.